might not be. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this guy here, which is a molecule of carbon dioxide. Um, so we keep blaming this little guy here. Uh, and you know what? It, it's not to be blamed because actually greenhouse gases in general are good for the planet. This is what keeps our planet warm enough for us to survive. It's like a little blanket keeping a little bit of heat in so we're here and we're happy. Uh, however, when we have a bit too much of it, it's a bit like today. I don't know you guys, but we all left the house with really heavy coats because the summer wasn't expected to be back today. <laughs> Well, it's a bit of the same. If you have a bit too much of it, you're just overdoing it. And that's what's happening. The excess greenhouses, particularly the excess of carbon dioxide, is what's causing global warming. And global warming, in turn, causes climate change. Uh, so what we're trying to, avo to do is try to avoid releasing so much greenhouses so that blanket remains healthy and our planet remains safe. The problem is, of course, that as we heard before, <coughs> If you don't keep that warming to up 1.5 degrees, and uh, remember, any warming is bad because it's getting us out of balance. But 1.5 degrees is what the scientists worked out that is, is kind of a safe, we, we can just about manage the consequences. Now, I went to COP to represent Nottingham, and when I came back, a lot of people were asking, did COP do anything, or top COP26? That's the United Nations um, Climate Change Conference last November. And I said, well, you know, prior to COP, if the scientists worked out that all the pledges that everyone signed up for in the Paris Agreement in 2015, if all of them were met, then we were heading for a global warming of 2.1 degrees. After COP, we're heading to 1.8 degrees of warming. Now, any degree of warming is bad, and 1.8 is lower than 2.1, so actually it's successful. But I must repeat this, all the pledges must be met in full and on time for us to just manage that degree of warming. <laughs> and let's just face it, humans have been very good at meeting other plants. <laughs> not on time, not ever fully, ever at all. Um, and of course, we're running out of time in order to get there. So it's really important we all engage with this, and it's a really big task for everyone. So I always, I start all my lectures every year showing <laughs> a slide that says, panic. Because what I really wanted to do is also panic with me. I know I have a, a bigger role to play in the sense that I'm teaching a lot of students, but also part of my role is to get you to panic a little bit, so you do a little bit too, and little bit by little bit we can get there. So I, I live in Nottingham. I'm originally from Brazil. Uh, I've been in Nottingham for almost 20 years. Nottingham has pledged to be carbon neutral by 2028, the first city in the UK. The first one to pledge, and the first one is trying to get to that target. Uh, that's really quite big. I've read this week that Copenhagen has just dropped the carbon neutrality target because they couldn't get funding for a particular big part of it. Uh, and they were meant to be the first one in Europe, I think. So it might be that Nottingham is, is if it's not the first in Europe, if it does achieve, it's quite close. Now, it's not an easy task, as you must imagine. A whole city is covered emissions. Everything we do at all times relieves, relieves carbon. Uh, being here today, transporting all the stents here, yourself to the site, all the food we're eating, everything releases carbon. So it's a really big task. Notting has managed so far to get it down by 57.7% per inhabitant, and uh, that's one of the largest drops in the whole of Europe. So that's really good news. Um, but also, a lot of the really big wins have been won. So we're getting down to the hardest bits to tackle. And that's where it becomes a lot more difficult. Now, I work at Surgery in the built, built Environment, Transport, Energy, and how people relate to those. Why are those important in this task? So the yellow bit is what econo economically is easy enough for low cost uh, things we could tackle. So the built environment, you can see, you can reduce emission quite significantly in a rel relatively low cost way. It's not low cost for you or me, because you, as you're going to see, I'm going to tell you a bit more about your own home. Uh, but relatively to the governments and to the leaders across the world is a much cheaper way to deal with uh, carbon emissions than some of the other issues. Now, we at the University of Nottingham, the group that I work on with my colleagues, uh, I tend to, I, sorry if I'm going to make up some words now, but I'm, I'm from Brazil, so I'm, no, English is not my first language, I'm allowed. So uh, I try to divide our work in three sections. We say we, um, we look into electrify. You probably heard a lot about electrification. Why? Because we're trying to decarbonize our energy grid. So the more renewable we have into the electricity grid, the less carbon we have released from the energy. So 
if you can make everything that we use electric, we could tend to reduce our carbon. And then in particular, it's transport. So you might be looking at purchasing an electric vehicle, if you are to purchase a vehicle next. Uh, and heating from buildings. So those are the two big things that we're going to electrify in the next few years. I also talk about rationalizing, and that's the most important of the first step. I reduce what we use in the first place. Electrifying and reducing the carbon emissions from the grid is not going to do the whole job. So we really do need to start using a lot less. And then it's modifying it, um, which you understand what it means, although it's made up. But I do mean you know, trying to understand where the energy flows are, where is the data, try to be able to control things with a more a higher level of granularity, try to take away some of the decisions from some people. For example, uh, you want to plug your car, and you want your car to do the best for the, for the environment as well as save you money, as opposed to having to decide on all those things. So this modification is a great way to move forward. I'm going to show you a few examples of our research where under those three, head three headings, of course, they intercept and interlap, but you get a, an idea. So um, give you the example of Nottingham. Why rationalize is so important and how far it can get us. Nottingham has about six 164,000 homes. Uh, now, have you heard of energy performance certificate? So maybe if you rent a home or, or if you've recently purchased a home, you might have had to have it um, analyzed and checked for its energy performance. So that's a little, uh, it's like a, a checkbox exercise for a little bit of maths that gives you a rating. And it's very much like your the rating they get from appliances. So from green to red, um, we should all be buying green, but we don't often do that when we purchase properties. Although uh, very unlikely going to go and purchase a fridge that is red. I don't know why, <coughs> but we still think the buildings are okay. They're not. But anyway, the government's proposing that all homes in the whole of the UK have to be at least an EPC level of C, i.e. be within the green zone by 2030, which is very soon, I'm sure you agree. In Nottingham, uh, that would be 61% of the homes that have to move from orange and reds into green within the next few years. And that's very similar to the rest of England. So most likely where you are, or well if you know all the neighborhood even worse, Newer neighborhood perhaps a bit better, but on average, we are about the same. About 60% of the homes need to be improved to that level. A home that is about an EPC level, an average of D, which is the average that we have in the UK at the moment, uh, releases about six tons of carbon per year. So per home, that's a lot of carbon. Now, let's assume that we did get them, get them all to EPC level C. Now, I live in an old Victorian house in a conservation zone. If you are with me, conservation zone, Old houses, it's a really tough job. I can't afford changing my windows because I can't change them for anything that is affordable in any way. It needs to be windows there that are acceptable in a conservation zone, replaced like for like, but with double glazing, ideally triple glazing. I can't put any insulation on my walls, internal or external. So it's a really tough job to get to PC level C, and quite unlikely we can get there. But let's assume I can, and you can too, and all your homes get to PC level C, and you're healthier, and you're spending less money. And I'm sure you're thinking, oh, that would be good if you've seen your energy bills this week, this month. Um, yeah, I think that's the time it's going to hit everyone, isn't it? When you see your <laughs> heating going on in October, and your gas bill comes next. Well, so if we did get them out to PC level C, the, they would be releasing about 4.5 tons of carbon per home. Uh, in Nottingham, that would lead us to a reduction of 247,000 tons of carbon, which still leaves us with 740,000 tons of carbon for the existing house stock alone per year. And of course, there's a lot of new homes being built. What does that mean? Well, there's the equivalent of about 740,000 hot air balloons every year, or the equivalent of 10, 10 times the area of the city of Nottingham in trees. So we cannot offset. Offset is just not an option. Because even here, that we're talking about all oh, the homes becoming much better, we still have such an enormous amount of offsetting to do that just there's no room for everybody. So I need to do better. Now, those 4.5 tons of carbon, if you look into this, so let's assume your house has all got to that level, 42% of that to be coming from heating in average. Now, if we electrify heating, and we can then tap into an electricity grid that is decarbonized, you're likely to get those 42% carbon emissions diminish or even disappearing, which is great. But that's just about half of the problem, isn't it? The other half is your choice of travel, your choice of food, the way you manage your waste. 
It's not one big wean. It's lots and lots of really little weans. And then when it gets really complicated, because you leave the light on, you think it's fine. It's just one LED that's been on. And indeed, one LED that's been on for a couple of hours is a tiny amount of energy and a tiny amount of carbon, also a tiny amount of money. But if all of us left one LED on for a couple of hours every day, just because it's fine, then altogether there's a lot of carbon. And it does seem quite small, but it's only when all those small things are put together that we're going to deal with each other 50% of the problem. So uh, one of the projects I've been looking at is looking at a roadmap for retrofitting Nottingham. So look at all those housing stock. Um, there's a lot to this project, but I'm only going to show a few bits and pieces for you to have a, a feel for it. It's funded by the government. Um, it is um, it's funded through the Community Renewal Fund. It's a leveling up fund agenda that has come out last year. So it's kind of a one-off fund the government had. Nottingham had four projects funded. Mo this is one of them. Uh, residential buildings represent at least 22% of the carbon emissions in the UK. If you start considering the, uh, your choice of transport, etc., then we're talking with doubling that up. 80% of those are still really bad. It still need improvement. So if you look at uh, what that really means, so this is really recent. So that's where you're likely spending your money in your energy bills. I think it just came out last month. It's from Wofgen. Uh, and you can see the big blob there is central heating. And central heating being on for six hours a day, I don't know how long you lift your own. Uh, hopefully, nobody has the central heating on yet. So you spend about almost 10 pounds for six hours of heating at the moment. And it might still go up again next year because we don't know what's going to go on. Uh, that is to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.